start recording. So, so guys, mute yourselves. Yeah, uh, that's this one right here. We're hearing a bunch of other stuff in the background. Yeah. And, and I'll, pastors. I'll, I'll, yeah, guys, if you if you wouldn't mind muting yourself, uh, that's good. And I'll start. I'm I'm actually assuming that Mitch probably got it an hour off, so I can I can fill in until that time. So, so welcome everybody. First of all, uh, to OSC's build camp. This is for September. And this is the first one actually that we're doing that is a uh, a remote session. So, and the way it turned out actually, we didn't get a lot of people signed up for the the 3D printer builds and the full program. We had like six people signed up, so we we shrunk it to a smaller program where we're just shipping the kits and then doing Mitch's session, and also we'll do a free CAD session on learning how to design just about anything. A very simple workflow using FreeCAD 16 that will get you going with a, just like 80% of anything you ever wanted to design. Uh, that's that's a session we can organize for afterwards. And if anyone started on a printer build, we can have a session right after the, the three, four hour electronics session. So in today's session, the goal is to to explore microcontrollers, which is uh, basically building one from scratch using uh, a tiny little chip like if you understand this is like this one little microcontroller chip that now can get you to the world of automation so a lot of times we build things like tractors and brick presses and 3d printers other things all those can be run on one of these one of these little controllers like if you talk about automation like for example the code in our brick press which is all automated uh, one of these controllers can run it in other words actuate the the pressing sequence of the brick press one after another so uh, the concept of a microcontroller is very powerful, and that's why we wanted to bring it into this this show uh, to to show you how you actually understand it. What is it? Building it from scratch, building a very very simple circuit that you can then program using Arduino environment. So there, you know, with modern technology, a, a chip that I mean, right now this chip costs a dollar. You can actually get into programming and automating things starting at one dollar and up so, so that's pretty amazing technology that we have access to today uh, but I'll, I'd like to talk start a little bit with um, intro to OSC and I guess some of you most of you have followed our work for a bit of time who's completely new to our work like hasn't heard anything about us and just found mm -hmm. out uh, anyone or you guys are all a little more or less okay um, so what I will do since since we have a little bit of time right now, I'll I'll, I'll do an introduction to OSE as in the kind of a, a typical 30-minute presentation that I that I give, so you get a good flavor. But just uh, just for your reference, we've been we've been at this game of open source hardware development for about a decade. I'm on a 30 acre parcel of land right here. This is the I'm actually in the Seed Eco Home that we built in 2016. Uh, you can download all the blueprints and design and Sweet Home 3D. You can replicate one of these houses. But actually, it's exciting because after all this time, next year we're actually going to be taking the the eco homes, the seed homes, prime time. So actually, we're uh, our goal is to to build a large number of these next year as we take this to a full product release. Um, and here's the package. It's um, a thousand square foot house that you and a friend can build in one week for fifty thousand dollars so that's I mean that's the most competitive you, you can get uh, there is a little bit of a catch in that you're actually preparing the the modules like ahead of time on weekends but that's a way that you can actually manage and spread the workflow so that so a complex project like a house build which is like wow you know myself I would have never imagined that I'd be doing this uh, but if you understand the basic skill sets you can certainly do it and we're making that super accessible to just about anybody uh, so so if you have a number of weekends to prepare them the way it works is you prepare four by eight foot modules which are like all the wall panels and, and things uh, and then you assemble it rapidly into place in, in about a week's time um, with as little as you and a friend so that's that's our milestone we we think we've got it pretty tight in terms of the time budget we're making the design as simple as possible to make it feasible and really pushing the limits of uh, collaborative development because in, in that process we're looking at 
uh, gathering a large number of people where not only is the the blueprints are the blueprints for the house open but we're creating an open enterprise around this what does that mean that means we're publishing all the the business sides of that which is uh, your on top of the the design and build instructions you've got marketing you've got product brochure you've got uh, economic analysis you've got uh, everything that's related to the business side including the training for how do you actually run a business like that um, which means that you would take the blueprints you can build the models the house models exactly as they are you can also modify them because the way we're doing it is a very much a construction set approach where you can you can do that and then using tools like FreeCAD you can actually do automated bill of materials generation it's like all the tools are there we got FreeCAD we got Sweet Home 3D got Blender and then you got wikis and live editable docs and you can talk about uh, collaborative design and and redesign using part libraries that are all now public and you can download them so the idea is that you've got your wall modules you got your roof modules you've got your window modules utility modules and and it's really a modular kind of an approach where we where we do that so let me actually uh, so that's a brief intro to that project and our our goal is um, it's pretty ambitious actually we're saying okay we can handle about 2,000 people so that means we're going to train a number, large number of entrepreneurs. We're going to do about 10 or so immersion training sessions where you come here for a week to learn the entire build. We're going to have a special program for entrepreneurs who stay for another week. And then you learn more about the business side and how to go through the zoning, the building codes, and through redesign and through bills of materials and sourcing and supporting people that are building. Because the entrepreneurs are going to be building, uh, basically supporting, the model is, we drop ship you the whole kit and then we support you throughout from A to Z of how you actually get to move into a house and that's that's the basic idea okay so with that said let me actually sh I'm gonna share my screen and, and do a presentation on um, so let me pull up um, on just just kind of a little more of the overview of like what I just told you which is a crazy idea with with the intent of solve we want to solve housing here it's like uh, we feel that nobody's doing it. It's like everyone talks about affordable housing and and when you look at the details like okay where's your super simple design, where's the open blueprints, where's the dis distributive enterprise which allows many people to replicate that. I think without that open source and also the open source enterprise element without that you can't be talking about solving that issue because it takes everybody's input to make the best product just like in software now Linux is absolutely dominated same things gonna happen with hardware we're not there yet we're about a decade or so away from that but um, that's that's the goal and how do you do that through large-scale collaborative design so our mission is collaborative design for a transparent and inclusive economy of abundance and we have to pay attention to that collaborative part because if you look at a lot of open source projects, a lot of open source projects are not super collaborative where some, some developers go off into a corner, they publish something and there you go, you can replicate it. But what about the whole process of developing it, making it better, and then taking on other parts like the enterprise side? Nobody really talks about the enterprise side when you talk about open hardware, so we're really trying to push, push the limits of that to make that a complete feasibility. So let me pull up a presentation and tell you a little more why and how this is possible uh, because we're we are absolutely convinced that that is indeed a possibility um, okay so let me go into the presentation here so let me share my screen now uh, okay share screen there we go uh, can you 
guys verify are you seeing my screen now with a presentation someone can unmute and so I can go forward yes we are okay excellent excellent so work of open source ecology is about the global village construction set 50 of the, di of the different industrial machines it take to ma takes to make a small civilization with modern comfort so applications are real we're talking about building real infrastructures for living um, if we frame it so right now we've got this whole political turmoil in America but here we're talking about here's the the closure of the divide between you've got your educated elites you've got physical production um, you've got those two worlds that right now are getting more and more separated with financialization when pretty much finance capital controls the way the world works well uh, that leads to huge centralization uh, so instead we're saying let's go to a distributed open source economy where communities have production on a local scale you're distributing wealth in unprecedented ways which is uh, this this poor distribution of wealth is this large part of what's happening on in a political system right now uh, a lot of people are getting marginalized so we're saying okay let's bring this down to the community level let's make access happen let's make a better life for everybody so I've talked about this in my TED talk on the Global Village Construction Center. You can go on TED online. You can um, Google my name. Yeah, I won't show that right now. That's still a great introduction to. It's a four-minute TED talk. I talk about the project, uh, and now I'd like to update you on what what the results are to date. As uh, because uh, as of 2013, so in tw 2008, actually, we started with the first ever prototype of the brick press. We started building tractors and other things. Uh, the prototyping went up and up, lost track in 2013. Uh, right now, um, oh, let's see. Right now, just, just for reference, like in terms of where we are in the overall prototyping with these 50 machines, we're about 30% done. And the thing is, we are giving ourselves until 2028 to do the whole set. Uh, that means we have to accelerate quite a bit. I mean, right now we're about like 1.5 million dollars of funding, which is like you know, you know a shoestring budget. But still, we got all these prototypes uh, completed, and 2028 is when we are saying, "Hey, this is uh, whatever we have at that time." And and I want to make sure that we finish everything. Uh, but 2028 is our cutoff un until the point where we go into applications like building real communities, building our notion of what we see as the OSC campus, which is a facility that's got agriculture production education training it's like a like a village like a micro state of source like a university campus but for real life and that's uh, so like our facility here 30 acres we want to make it a state of art research and development facility and replicate such facilities worldwide so that they recreate economies wherever they are uh, I'd like to start with uh, our milestones so first of all we found that people can replicate our stuff like this is our first replication of the brick press that people have done uh, this is James Slade in Texas uh, this was like 2011 or such, uh, no, some, somewhere around there. People took our blueprints from online and replicated them. Uh, and, the, and by doing clear documentation, like even up to like IKEA style fabrication diagrams, people can actually do this. It's, it's manageable. Like this, this guy, for example, he was a computer programmer and, and he uh, picked up welding and he did this. So, hey, you can learn it too. Uh, radical modularity. So we build tractors. Uh, we use very modular, very much modular design where you have this box beam construction tubing. We've got modular power units, modular engine units uh, that makes the design much more simple. So essentially like a tractor is a box with wheels, a frame structure, wheels, drive, hydraulic controls. Power cubes are engine units. That's part of the modularity, which is a engine driven unit that pr can power your tractor or a brick press or a CNC machine even like a heavy-duty mill or something and it's a universal power source universal rotors are other modules we use such as in this tractor we use it on a trencher like the same thing is on the front on the trencher and the same same universal rotor module is on the wheels to drive the wheels uh, we build smaller machines like this tractor this is near product release so a lot of our stuff is near product release um, we're actually now selling the printer but that's the only thing we're selling. next year we aim to sell begin uh, producing the houses as I mentioned the tractors as well so that's for next year um, so module based design is what we follow so you can break break apart the set the whole global village construction set first into 50 machines then you've got 
uh, a number of modules that it, each machine is made of. So we do that kind of a breakdown. Uh, that's called module-based design. You can break, break things down just like in software into many, many parts so that you can develop any module at all the different, say about 40 or so different steps of product development from your concept design to your CAD to your build instructions, bills and materials and things like that. But that allows you to, to have many people involved because our goal is collaborative design on a large scale. So how do you get a lot of people involved? Break it down, just like software has done it. Linux has like 2,000 full-time people working on it right now. We need those kinds of same numbers for open hardware. We follow construction set approaches where we, we know that that can be done for mechanical things, but why not do that for electronics, for CNC machines, for everything? Uh, that's an approach that works for a lot of different areas of endeavor. Um, one milestone we've reached is reducing prototyping cycle from months to days using the modularity. So here's uh, an iron worker machine for cutting slabs of steel. That's a heavy duty in industrial machine. Uh, cuts one inch by 12 inch slabs of steel. Uh, that took, uh, took us six months to build the one on the left. We redesigned it for absolute simplicity and it took us one day to build the one on the right. That thing could still cut a one by 12 inch slab of steel. So uh, by using modularity, you can reduce prototyping cycle extremely. We also learn how to build things in one day like the brick press. Um, the brick press, this is, that's the production run of the brick press right here. We can build a tractor or a brick press in a single day with a team of people, like 12 people plus. Um, so that's pretty, pretty amazing. It's uh, because we're showing that industrial productivity can be achieved on a small scale. I mentioned that in my TED talk. And you have to have a basic level of efficiency for this kind of uh, open hardware to work. You can't, you can't be inefficient, that's, that's just the bottom line and that's just a fact of life. For If you want to make life easy for everybody, uh, you have to start by addressing basic needs and that's productivity, to get your food, to get your housing, your infrastructures built. Scalability, so here is, uh, uh, here's the D3D Universal, D3D Pro. Scalability um, refers to that you can use the same same parts to make larger things like just with the same universal axis this is the universal CNC axis that's found in our uh, 3D printers you can make a small printer a larger one or even a larger one like this which is one cubic meter or you can go into larger rods these are eight millimeter rods these are 25 millimeter rods here uh, to make much larger machines like this torch table so that's all scalability or you can even increase, so this is uh, Justin, you've seen that, uh, 50 millimeter shaft. We started on a build of this, that's Justin right there, uh, of a much heavier uh, heavier CNC machine that we didn't finish that one yet though. Um, another milestone we've achieved is real-time documentation. With the world of internet, you can have people, just like we're doing right now, people in remote locations look at what you're doing if you've got video feeds, so using uh, Hangouts, or video conferencing, we generated a, an instructional at the same time that we were done with a build. And that's a pretty remarkable thing because typically you lose the documentation, but if you can involve other people, you can catch it and therefore address that, that big part. Uh, we also do swarm builds like the Amish, but we do it for, for things like the Seed Eco Home here. That's where I live right now. Here we build that with uh, 50 people in five days. Swarm build is an important concept because it allows uh, a social productive process to t address real production. So you're you're combining productivity and skills training and community all in one. So we think this kind of a model can be used much more, not just for the Amish, but for more people as we start to collaborate, just work with, with others more and make a better world by uh, sharing, by doing collaborative process. So for example, with the new guys uh, in Austria, they're working on a thing called Vivi House. They have blueprints for an open source house that goes up to six stories. So imagine getting like 500 people over a weekend or something or a week and build that thing. So that means you're building real capital with social capital and collaboration. So instead of uh, relying 100% on finance capital like we do today, you can introduce a different model of financing of uh, serious projects which could apply to anything. It could apply to uh, like to the limit, like talking about a semiconductor fab 
how would it look like if we collaboratively funded, built, and operated that? Well, different world. So this is just a, something to think about. How do we replace the, the reliance on just plain capital to, to do things? Because what's capital? Capital is human labor, it's materials. So materials come from the earth and you can process that. So the point is you, there's abundant resources available, but the distribution of how we do that in society is somewhat unfair and that's what we're trying to address. So swarm builds, building micro houses. Um, in the swarm builds, you have to address a uh, very efficient build process. You have to plan it all out. How how are you gonna do that? Uh, so, yeah, like here we've demonstrated that we can build it. Like once we have a whole two chain of people passing bricks and using these stops on the back, we could build this thing really quickly. Like it took us a few seconds per block to lay these walls. So if we sustained that, th those walls would have gone up in like two hours using like a bunch of people as you see here now yeah there were some things we were still figuring out like these stops here it was kind of really messy to go over them but we learned for next time so the bottom line is it is possible to have extremely fast builds with uh, a social build process so that's that's really good news this, this was in Belize just this this j past January before COVID hit um, that was the as far as we got in that build uh, we also talk about product ecology. So, so one of our milestones is that we design things for whole uh, construction set approaches where parts are shared between different machines. We talk about one ma one machine building another. Like here, for example, you can have the 3D printer build parts for the torch table for cutting steel, and the, then the torch table builds things like the brick press and the tractor. So that's definitely a product ecology where one machine feeds into the other. Uh, you can build other things product ecology is applying to natural ecosystems like the aquapana greenhouse here that we built in another workshop that's uh heated water with tilapia in there feeding the growing towers and like 10,000 nut plants here that we planted out mm -hmm. afterwards most of them got eaten up by rabbits but we have to do that again um and then big big point about open source technology is you, you introduce the concept of lifetime design which I, I would say it's pretty much impossible with proprietary technology when um, you don't even have access to parts or how things work or you know if something breaks you have got to throw it away with lifetime design transparency open source you can you decide how long a thing lives because you can repair it or you can replace replace parts and here we're showing uh, some of the machines of the global village construction set okay take your shredder uh, you grind up your tractors, cars, and power supplies to <laughs> to make either steel, like metals or plastics, which you can then extrude out as molten steel or molten plastic. Then you can make filament for 3D printers. You can roll out your steel into virgin steel to make into, like after you process it with CNC machines for CNC machining, you can get engine parts. So basically, you can, you can have this complete circular economy with some of the tools that are found in the Global Village construction set, which is pretty exciting because I think uh, circular economy, a lot of people are talking about it these days, and it's a thing to do. It's just like nature recycles its resources. Imagine that, that <laughs> uh, recycling didn't happen in nature, like the world would fill with dung and <laughs> we would all die. Well, you got to do the same thing on on the technological front you gotta recycle things to to make it like a biological system so as I mentioned industrial productivity can be achieved on a small scale that's a major major discovery personally I live that every day here I know that we can build things and build tractors and build houses and we're really pushing the front on the housing next year uh, as I mentioned so it's all exciting and some of the you know just what are the limits to this well there aren't any like we're we're saying that a 40 acre parcel of land just any parcel of land has all the resources rocks plants sunlight soil water uh, rocks take rocks rocks uh, aluminosilicate clay clay is aluminosilicate you can extract aluminum from aluminosilicate if you have a machine to do that and energy to to put into that process so there are no limits to what you've got for material and product material productivity given that we still have 10,000 times more power that comes from the Sun than we use today so like uh, you know a lot of people are concerned about energy yes that's a real concern you've got coal burning power plants you got nukes but we could do it all from solar we just have to shift the economy towards towards that by by popular will uh, it's not the politicians that will do it it's you that will do it we we have to basically be aware that hey this is all possible and we we need to do that right now 
And high-tech stuff like even air, air bearing making lathes. So this is like a super, super high precision lathe. This guy shows you how to build that from scratch. Uh, and you can make air bearings to, to make jet engines and turbo pumps to make semiconductors and rocket ships. Hey, there you go. You can all do it uh, DIY. Okay, so the next frontier is extreme enterprise. So right now, um, the big thing that, if I want to summarize what we learned over the years, is that um, it's really tough to get to the enterprise level with open source hardware because it just takes so much effort. And if you compare it to software, actually that metaphor is really good because in software you'll make, how many bug changes will you do? How many bug fixes? Hundreds, thousands, right? Well, uh, I must admit from my experience that it's the same with hardware too. Like there are, like you can keep improving something over and over forever and it's just an expensive process and because you're dealing with hardware, uh, you spend that, you end up spending a lot of money and nobody has the energy to do that. So for hardware, it's really hard to um, make really good viable products in the open source method. So you really got to put in the effort to do that by putting in enough development into that process. Uh, you can't go into this thing where, where I like to cite the example of like the CNC router, like how many thousands of CNC router builds are out there on on uh, instructables or over the internet and there's not like one single good product well because the first person develops it they get so far they kind of give up the next person reinvents the wheel and they give up because it's you got to go through a hundred or a thousand prototypes uh, to make it really really good and it never gets done so I call that the open source hardware trap y you uh, you get to a certain point and you never take it to the finish line that's a big thing we noticed in our work, and that's something that really crystallized for me just personally, like over the last year, where we're saying, no, we gotta, we gotta put in enough resource to take that whole development process to completion. So uh, that's the idea of the extreme enterprise. So for example, for the house, the house builds, um, we are talking about about a thousand or two thousand people, a hackathon with that many people, uh, and we're actually saying these 2,000 people are going to be the developers who are going to end up with a house. We're going to look look at uh, involving 2,000 st heavy stakeholders, people who collaborate the, in the uh, actual part of the development process in terms of developing the full enterprise. So there's a lot of documentation and development work that that uh, is required. And we're just going to say, okay, we need thousands of people to do it. Let's do a big event that makes it happen. Now that's pretty crazy because how do you ever manage this kind of a, a large process? But with modular breakdown and role allocation, just heavyweight product management, I think would be the term. It's an agile process, but you have a heavy uh, breakdown of tasks into many, many tasks along many disciplines, like from the design to, to the business side. And we're going to experiment on how that could be done in a practical way. So major, major stuff happening next year on this with the house. We already talked about distributed enterprise, the concept that if you, if, you, if you have a good enterprise, why not share it with the world so everyone can get to the, the state of art? Because the other way around is, um, I like to give the example of school. Like in school, well, school teaches you to produce things at the end of the day. You produce, like you're either in manufacturing, you're either producing knowledge, like in research or whatever, but you learn to produce things, but you never learn how to produce the best stuff because the best stuff is always proprietary or hidden. So the way the system works right now, we're enforcing the teaching of mediocrity throughout the population. That, you know, that's a, that's a real simplified way to, to say it, but that's, that's what happens. Like if you do not have access to state-of-art information, you're reinforcing mediocrity. And the only way we can get past that is by open source collaborative development where we're saying, no, we got to bring everybody up. It's not about one company being the best and everybody else being behind. It's about everybody. And that's that major shift of mindset that needs to happen. So it's a cultural thing. It's not a technical thing. It's a cultural thing within each of us to say that, first of all, we're committed to making that happen because it's possible and desirable, and then, then pursue making it happen through open source. Okay, well, as far let's get back to some revenue and, and uh, business models around this. What we have already seen is running 3D, both 3D printer, brick press, tractor workshops, house workshops. 
uh, when we build a, a brick press, uh, we can generate 10k of revenue over a weekend. So we sell the brick press, and then we also charge people tuition for participating in an event. So we've seen events where we can generate ten thousand dollars of revenue for over a weekend, which pretty much can sustain an event like that. It's a lot of work to organize it, but if you streamline it and and can and clone it essentially, like really get it streamlined and efficient, it actually works. So we're doing stuff like building printers where in physical life you can build like a dozen printers over a weekend or such, uh, where we charge people $300 over the bill of materials cost for that experience. So there's a revenue model there. And then for the house, um, this CD home here costs 25, it's more like 30K um, in materials, but we we raised 25k of revenue from all the tuitions from there was a hundred people that participated in total um, and our goal right now so here we're saying we're aiming to give provide turnkey houses at 70k and that's about right in fact we're saying 50,000 if you're the owner builder so this is at least one third the cost of industry standards so this is very efficient you still get a good product uh, but the revenue model is definitely there. If you make the process efficient, then you can do it. Now, uh, just read an article as far as why has modular housing or like low-cost housing never succeeded? And, a, and an essential answer was uh, because the process is so complex and there's so many parties involved, each guy passes the risk on to the next guy. What I mean by that is your designer is not your engineer, the engineer is not the builder, the builder is not the user. Essentially, that's the kind of a break. In each of those breaks, the for example, the architect is not going to design it to be buildable or cheap, nor is the, archi nor is the engineer going to design it to be uh, effective unless the engineer is the builder and cares about the fact that what he designed is going to take ten, 10 times longer to build than if you really paid attention to that. So all those kinds of breaks add up cost. And what we do here is we're the, we're the designers, builders, users, dog fooders, and we care about each step following the next in the most efficient way. And that is essentially how we can deliver this kind of a house. The house we're going to offer, this one is 1,400 square feet. The one we're going to offer is going to be 1,000 square feet for the base package uh, for $50,000, $50 a square foot. Uh, but essentially, if you make it efficient and open source, collaborative, then you can do it. So it's all these elements that add up to it, but we're ready for some prime time on that. That's the CD home model graphic. So, so in this home, like for example, this house is actually off grid. Um, it's got photovoltaics on the roof, and that's actually um, off grid operation. We're also connected to the grid for backup at night. Um, yeah, I uh, just want to mention a comment like how we how we get to this radical kind of collaborative development because I called out for thousands of people collaborating and, and what I'm trying to make a point here is uh, in Linux the metaphor there is or the analogy is that when Linux was started Linux was very deliberate about within like a year or two having a product that's a minimum viable product that people can use and that's how he got the support and then people actually buying into it supporting it and funding it because it was a product and that's that's the same thing where we need to do with hardware and that's why we're calling for the extreme enterprise model to get enough of that effort so that on a year or two time scale you can get to a product that's a minimum viable product uh, right now in the Linux model there's like this is actually the number of developers per kernel person so it's like a little under 2,000 people these are full-time developers uh, on the Linux kernel we need to do the same now we didn't we don't do the same in our work in our work we like this is some data from 2013 in our project we only got like up to like 20 people to show up for a development event a design sprint well numbers are not happening <laughs> Um, so we need to do better. Uh, here, we're, this is actually showing the level of completion for all the projects. 3D printer, micro house, CB press, power cube, micro tractor, circuit mill, universal rotor, cell pulverizer, laser cutter, tractor. Uh, those things are pretty much uh, at product release level, like if we productization level, where you can actually start running those as enterprises. And then everything else, about 30% complete.
so yeah, we've been moving, inching along from 2014. You can see in 2018 we did a little better. Uh, the, the state of completion is getting filled in, just for reference. Uh, so this is module-based design. Uh, this is about collaborative development. How do you do a large breakdown? I mentioned about breaking down the development steps into many, many steps. This is how we do it. This is actually an embeddable wiki template, so you can readily generate this thing on a wiki and keep version histories as well. And now it comes to the Extreme Enterprise 2000 developers in one weekend. Yes, did I say one weekend? Yes, we're going to put 2000 developers together with a number of probably like 20 or 20 or so product managers, but do a crazy event over a weekend where you spend uh, about 24 hours, so like eight hours times three days. But we're going to try to gather this crazy event over like one startup kind of a weekend it's an enter extreme enterprise startup weekend and the motivation there is that uh, if we collect these 2,000 people the motivation is very strong you're actually a client for building one of these houses can we do it we'll see well the end end effect is getting some significant product uh, so we're in the planning stages of that I won't get into too much on that um, yeah, the catch to this $50,000 1,000 square foot house is that you build a few panels every weekend for a bunch of weekends, and then you spend a 40-hour week with, with a friend. The other catch is you got to BYOL, bring your own land. Uh, but th there's really good news on bring your own land in America. You go on Zillow.com, and it's unreal, but there's plenty of lots between... Uh, you know, $5,000, $10,000, even as low as uh, $2,000, you can get lots, even in cities like Chicago and everywhere in the countryside. I mean, there's land. The, the point is, if, if you know how to build or if you have the, the guidance of how to build, you can do this. This is doable, and that's, that's what we're trying to show. Uh, so here's uh, more stuff. Yeah, so, so next year, essentially, I'm going to quit this presentation and get back to... Um, get back to the to everybody but um let's see let me uh, you guys all appear at about yeah so that's kind of a big overview of what we're doing right now um, we have started producing the 3d printers we are doing the like you see here I've got the the 3d universal sitting here cranking out parts here and there, we're selling the the D3D Pro printers. The same technology for this printer, as you saw here, applies to building a printer with an 18-inch print bed. So that's the scalability concept. Uh, and next year, prime time on the houses. We also want to get the tractors actual release, where we're releasing that as a distributive enterprise, where we're teaching people how to do that in many cities around the world. Amazing. That's so very exciting. Uh, also, the other thing, as far as the latest update on how we go about replicating this, we found that it's very hard to replicate this. Uh, you really need like a year or two year immersion in this to make this happen. Um, so that's exactly what we're offering. We're right now offering a, a one or two year mentorship where if you want to learn how to do all of this and do the collaborative design process, learn FreeCAD, learn construction, uh, the construction set approach, learning the design guides, starting with the 3D printer work, and then moving on to other machines. We're offering a one or two year, one or two year, two years if you do it half time, one year full time. But that's the amount of time that I think I could teach somebody to uh, go from scratch to building printers, wielding a torch and a welder, and building crazy things. Uh, we have our first candidate that's actually started this program, a guy from South Africa, and he wants to start an enterprise doing 3D printers for education in South Africa, where nobody is doing that in South Africa. And he wants to move on to, he's actually a guy in the mining industry, he's a consultant in the mining industry, so he's actually talked about, he actually started an operation for refining chromium ore, because they got those rocks over there, so they can make stainless steel. Uh, but uh, he wants to start an operation where he's actually making metal uh, from the rocks they got in the ground there. So that will be the, the long-term outcome of that, that endeavor. Uh, but it's all exciting, so um, I guess maybe I'll quit at that. I see Mitch is online, and I think Mitch we probably missed because of the time difference. 
so maybe maybe a, a few questions right now, but maybe we, we should get right into Mitch. Um, Mitch's session on the Arduinos as far as the controllers that can automate a lot of this technology here. So any questions for now or maybe we save them till later? What do you guys think? Um, maybe more of a comment. Uh, I like the metaphor you use with the open source software, but the s software is very easy to copy and uh, you know clone or whatever. My um, my uh, and, and today Linux is not developed by individual contributors full yeah. time. All those guys are paid by enterprises. Right. So I like what you suggested that that uh, there's an enterprise aspect to it that needs to be solved, and you want to do that open source. Mm -hmm. I, it's not I, other than uh, Red Hat. There's no other enterprise out there in the Fortune 500 that can contribute uh, to Linux at the scale it needs to. So I, I think there's a detail there that is a bit mis misguiding when you when you talk about it. That maybe would need some clarification. The metaphor doesn't translate. My my impression. Uh, it doesn't translate, but my understanding of it is that take Microsoft. From what I understand, Microsoft is the number one supporter of open software right now so amazon apple right. google all of them so um which part of the metaphor do you think is different uh, they're all for private companies they are all private companies and and they keep things uh closed even the, their open source projects are first closed and then they open them up once they reach some okay basic viability so the, the model is very different the, mm. In, in, in that sense. But I, I mean, I agree, there's still a swath of, of developers that, that participate for free just because they enjoy the, the project and yeah. th that is always desirable. Yeah, so I think at the, at the biggest level, like the general idea is that they contribute to a common core. They may not be as exactly collaborative or distributive, like essentially distributed. Like we talk about distributive where we say if we have a business model for the best product, everybody should do that because it's good for everybody that's certainly not what they're saying but uh just the idea that they are collaborating is good well that they're open sourcing the core from which others can derive their revenue models from i mean from one person from a very critical perspective you can also say that that is the promise of open source has not been delivered because the distribution of wealth in general is not much better today than say 20 years ago you can s see if you look at the Gini coefficient which is the measure of the distribution of wealth uh, Google Gini coefficient uh, but there is some evidence that the Gini coefficient like the lower it is that means the more well distributed wealth is throughout the planet one means that one person has all the wealth of the entire world zero is where it's everybody's uh, equal uh, we're at about 0.7 today about 0.7 I think uh, it's dropping down s a little bit since the the information age came about but it's not significant and I think we need the 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 collaborative mindset which is missing to make it go to the that next level of distributive where we're actually making life better for everybody which I mean, yeah, we're we're hitting some real limits of that right now with the political situations across the globe, showing how the disparity of wealth is really hitting everybody with in terms of the neoliberal order, uh, sh showing its ugly side. But it's up to us to correct that. I mean, I, you know, just a small fraction of development can open source up to like semiconductor fab. You're talking about on an order of definitely less than a trillion dollars probably around a billion dollars you might get an open source an entire open source economy with a billion dollars now the t today's economy is a hundred trillion so even one trillion would be one percent of the entire economy so point is it's doable anytime right now if people wake up to the fact that we have energy we have resources we just we just have to share because like Gandhi said there's enough for everybody but not as long as there's a single greedy person so we just gotta grow up and that's why we do the work that we do we, we hope to make a good impact on that next year with the the open housing project where that would now get the financial feedback loops happening so then we can start funding the massive collaborative development that we talk about so we can knock out the tractors and and energy systems and cars and 
everything else that's open source, open source agriculture and everything uh, to make make a different world. So it's very optimistic about them. Um, you know, the farther I go personally, uh, the more encouraged I feel because there are no technological bounds to this, like limits to what can be done. It's just people's mindsets. We've identified that collaborative, the mindset of collaborative literacy is the thing that's missing in today's culture. It's not anything about technology or possibility. It's all about what we think is possible at this point. So, yeah. Yeah, so any any other comments? Or we'll save it, maybe we'll get right into Mitch. Okay, so Mitch, unmute yourself, and maybe we can hand it over to you. So Mitch, we've talked about, um, so we gave the intro to OSE, and now, Mitch, do you have video? There you yeah, are. Yeah, that was great. I didn't, I didn't catch uh, all of your intro, but uh, I caught the last half hour, and yeah, lots of good stuff. So, um, yeah, this is yeah. Uh, a, a good intro for what I'm doing. Uh, philosophically. So I, I of course, uh, interject philosophy in everything I do, but uh, I'm going to be more technically oriented in what I'm going to present. Um, and um, it's fun stuff. And I hope you'll, you'll agree that it's fun. And it's also easy to learn the basics of electronics so that anyone can make lots of incredibly cool things just with your own imagination and a few skills which I'll show you. <laughs> 